Pour écouter cette session en français, veuillez cliquer en bas de votre écran sur l'onglet Interprétation et sélectionner le drapeau français. Hello. Bonjour. Barry Saleho. On behalf of Ikle Africa, the African Center for Cities, our future cities, Red Cross Crescent Climate Center, and partners, we're excited to welcome all of you to the Rise Africa 2022 Action Festival. Rise Africa has been growing since 2020 as a platform for thinkers, doers, and enablers committed to inspiring action for sustainable cities. This year's theme is creativity. For me, this means blending skills to be able to communicate the climate change complexity in rapidly urbanizing cities. I think we have such untapped potential in Africa when it comes to creativity. There's so much about Africa that is yet to be told. There are so many people in the African continent who have a huge skill base and are creative in the way they approach challenges. Creativity in Africa is about embracing our hope. It's about dynamism and it's about embracing our indigenous knowledge. I think agency is finding ways of giving power back to people, to groups, to young people, especially on a continent where it's a very young population. I like the approach of bringing everyone together, right? It doesn't necessarily need to be this expert, this high-ranking official. I think what agency means to me is change from, from the ground up. The importance of urgency is the recognition of the past and the recognition that we've lost time. Urgency is about acting now to build more inclusive, productive and resilient cities. There's this need to creatively redesign and unlearn and explore new ways of thinking. The festival is hosting 33 sessions with 135 provocateurs from across Africa and the world. Every session aims to show new ideas, showcase ongoing action, and launch new initiatives, bringing participants together to chart a new route forward. We hope that the festival program will inspire you. At the festival, we encourage you to showcase your business and projects, build lasting partnerships, unleash your creative potential, commit to sustainable action. Rise Africa is about translating ideas into action. What actions are you going to commit to this festival? Before the session begins, it is important to note that you're being recorded. And by participating, you are given the consent to be recorded. All recordings will be available on the program page after the festival. Creative expression is vital for creating new futures for our cities. And so we invite you to enter this session in the spirit of creativity and dreaming. I don't expect you to clown yourselves and collapse the distance and difference between sharing bread and sharing bed. I know that feeling, so give me a break and stop the fake. They say a hungry man is an angry man, but I say I am not hungry, I am hunger. I am not angry, I am anger. I am not dangerous, I am danger. I am an abominable time bomb, able to blast limestones and thunderbolts because somehow I am torn, tried and tired. So you see, you don't have to hear the sound of my voice before you know that hunger is real, scarcity is not. So please, check the time. It's history time, passion time, meaning time, access time, free flow time, sharing time, bread time, your time, my time, our time. Now, oh, now is urgent time. Africa and its people. It is also the new global currency. The innate capacity of Africans to use creativity to thrive um, through complexity is one that must be leveraged um, to get the continent ahead. The African continental free trade area is a new opportunity for Africans to expand their horizons, seizing markets in countries that have ratified the agreement. One of the areas in which this can work is through public art. 
expressed, for example, through creative, creative and cultural industries, CCIs. The sector holds the promise of securing a unique space for Africa's creatives to participate in the design and realization of the African market. Public art performs many functions. It expresses community values, enhance um, envir the environment, um, heightens awareness on certain issues, or challenges our perspectives and assumptions. It's through public art that we hope to unlock, not unlock, but enhance um, Africa's creativity so that we can make sure that the for sustainable development on the continent. Um, Baz Art um, started in 2016, and we aspire to become one of the most prominent public art platforms in Africa. The photo I selected for this opening slide shows um, one of our works that we did in Nairobi last year um, for Apple Music. Um, and it's one of our artists in our network who's painting that in Nairobi. And it's for the, the, the musician Octa Piso. Um, and you can just see the vibrant colors. And yeah, it's yeah, it's just it creates the, obviously as a marketing tool, it, it creates buzz and, and communication and dialogue. But also just that vibrancy just makes me feel inspired to also create and be part of the creative economy. Um, so with this session, with this aspiration that Bazart has, we hope to soon be able to do a continental artwork installation where we have a series of murals over the whole continent. Um, this will obviously is quite an ambitious project, which we hope we can actually realize. With this session, we have thought leaders from heterogeneous fields, um, and we hope to learn. This is an ac action session, so we hope to learn from them um, to help um, how, how to create thriving African cities. So we want to, through this session, we aim to have three outcomes, and that's to create awareness on the links between creativity and the AFCTFA, explore creativity within urbanism and at a continental scale, and then also position public art as an accelerator and influential communicator to attaining, in attaining Africa's development objectives through the AFCTSA. I would now like to introduce Dr. Joy Katagekwa. Dr. Joy Katagekwa is a leading trade, investment and development law and policy specialist with over 17 years of experience, which also include at leadership level in shaping global and regional trade and development deals. See, she is the strategic advisor to the assistant administrator and director of UNDP's Regional Bureau for Africa in New York, supporting strategy and delivery of a $1.2 billion development program spanning over 46 or spanning um, over 46 sub-Saharan African countries. Thank you, Dr. Joy. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Carla, and uh, good morning from New York. It's a pleasure to join you. Happy Africa Day. It is a day we celebrate the greatness that we are and think ahead also as to how to seize much more of that Africa promise. So I was asked to talk about how the AFCFTA can advance the creatives in Africa. And, you know, I'm drawn to this conversation precisely because of the energy that surrounds it. When Carla approached me a few months ago to do this, I was fascinated by her energy, her passion, and really this reminder that it will take the zeal of Africa's young people to drive the continent to that place that we want to go to, which is an Africa that provides decent livelihoods for its people, that provides the, the, the the elements that can allow for thriving economies to take place on the continent of Africa. I think we've gotten much, much closer to that time now with the African continent of free trade area. And so in doing this, I guess I'll answer three questions because we're talking about three protocols uh, that can promote the creatives. And so in a sense, the first question would be, what are those three protocols? And then the second one would be, why are they transformative? And then the third is, how do you seize these opportunities? I am really pleased that some of the other speakers that will be you know, joining the conversation are very much in the heart 
of their creative space. So they'll be able to speak from a practical perspective as well. So what are these three protocols? You know, when we think about the African continent of free trade area, it's a bit of a tongue twister, which surprises me in many ways. But when we think about the AFCFTA, we're really talking about the attempt of the continent to break with the cycle of locking Africa at the bottom of the world's wealth creation process, which means that Africa provides those elements that are the basis for the creation of wealth elsewhere. How this happens in trade policy is that there is a penalization as to the advancement in production through tariff policy, through discriminatory regulations and so on and so forth. And so the AFCFTA tries to break with that cycle to ensure that Africa's resources work for Africa's development by creating a structure of trade policy that facilitates, enables, incentivizes production on the continent. And so the first protocol in there would be the protocol on trade inputs. The second one would be the protocol on trade in services. And the third would be the dispute settlement protocol. This is the architecture we have right now, which is envisaged to increase as well. So let's talk a little bit about the protocol on trade in goods. This is really that promise that to, to the tune of 97% of tariff lines, we shall remove barriers to intra-African trade. Now, when you think about it, it can be everything under the sun that is capable of production for the tangibles that we touch. Now, of course, 97 is not 100, but 97 is sufficiently critical to push a revolution of made in Africa. At the end of last year, UNDP and the AFCFTA Secretariat released a report that tried to understand what this means below the headlines, i.e. what are the value chains that are practically emerging in this thing called the AFCFT. And the results are fascinating because what was so, and I will share it with Carla later, is really a set of 10 value chains that show us that it is possible to make in Africa. And all of these things are critical. And I encourage you to listen to them from the perspective of promise. Someone said, let's listen as we dream, promise. Because think about it, automotives, lithium iron batteries, leather and leather products, cocoa products, soya, textiles, pharmaceuticals, vaccines, mobile financial services, cultural industry services. And so when you think about it as creatives, all of these in a sense have a bearing on the efficiency with which you would engage in the cultural services. And so let me, let me segue then into the other protocol because you'll be thinking, well, we're creatives, we're in the services sector. So what does the services protocol, which is the second protocol tell us? It really gives us this promise that for the state parties that have ratified the agreement, i.e. committed to be bound by its rights and obligations, that there will be henceforth preferential treatment to services and services suppliers, in a sense, removing the possibility to discriminate against services and services suppliers based on the nationality of the country from which the service is originating. And secondly, from the services and services suppliers once they enter the markets of other AFCFTA parties. And five sectors have been prioritized as the initial ones. So let me go through them quickly. So you have finance, you have communication, you have transport, you have business services, you have tourism. What does this mean for the creatives? Let's try to break down what communication services means for purposes of this treaty called the AFCFTA. When you unpack all of that, you're really looking at audiovisual services, for example, as a component of communication services. And there you have motion uh, production on, or videos. You know, you have a, a motion, a sort of picture projection. You have a distribution TV transmission. You have radio services. You have recording and so on and so forth. And so when you look also at business services, inside of that, you have recreational services. And these services have a particular component linked to creatives because that is where you have the entertainment services. But then again, we're not only talking about um, these particular five services. We're talking about the interface between all of them for purposes of accelerating the possibility of delivering creative services in this conversation. And so how do creatives fit there practically? In this analysis that we had as, as UNDP and the AFCFTA Secretariat, we found that there are legitimate sort of like business propositions in the area of cultural services, cultural industries. Here you have opportunities for hiring writers, actors, technicians, for example, on a movie project, the possibility of filming, 
post-production editing, marketing promotion, distribution. And in each of these sub, sub sort of parts of the value chain, you ask yourself, what do I do to position myself? And I'd like to go to the last part, which is how do you seize the opportunities in that? Of course, the third protocol is dispute. What if we disagree? And there's a facility for that. But I'd like to talk about how you seize it. You seize it in the following way. By positioning yourself to understand what is on offer, by demanding that the regulations and the complementary administrative processes that will influence whether you can access these markets or not, such as things like qualification requirements and procedures, are your, are your qualifications recognized, for example, such as the ability to move to supply the services, such as the ability to have complementary services like digital services, ETC, that enable you to enhance your capacity to provide these services, and also issues around basically ensuring that digitalization continues to advance um, your possibility to engage in creative services. Let me close off by talking about why this is transformative. Before the AFCFTA, you know, the creatives is an industry that has succeeded against the odds in the sense that you don't really have those platforms pre-AFCFTA, pre the services protocol that give you a step ahead at continental scale. Now you have it. What's important is really to understand it, to understand its detail, to demand this treatment, and to ensure that you advocate for those aspects that will make it possible for you to utilize the opportunities. Visas are a critical one. Recognition of qualifications is a critical one. But again, just building the coalition around, especially the second phase of the negotiations, which is around intellectual property. Because as you know, in the creatives, ownership is about whether you have the rights, so to speak, from an intellectual perspective. So I hope I've triggered your thoughts as to the fact that there is something concrete for creative uh, industry in the AFC FTA, but it's a confluence between goods and services because services are critical for goods, but you also need the goods themselves to yield uh, creative services effectively. And I hope I've left you with a thought to think we need to advocate to make it happen. Thank you very much, Carla. Thank you, Dr. Joy. Um, I, I am very respectful of your time. Um, we have you for five more minutes before you have to jot off to your meeting. And thank you very much that we, it's it's eight o'clock in the morning at your, in New York or nine, eight o'clock? Nine. Oh. nine. <laughs> Thank you for waking or being in the office um, this early. Um, I constantly I'm thinking of dynamism and um, in in the cultural value chain or in the CCI value chains, and so I'm like constantly pondering that, and I'm pondering. So now we have the AOCTFA, which can actually enable free movement of people and the trade of goods without tariffs and etc etc which the AOCTFA will enable what i'm thinking now and i'm constantly thinking of um, and I, I compare the creative the ccis to ethiopia uh, ethiopia's um flory um sector um and i'm thinking yeah just how but that was obviously with um states um with the push from the states um, state buy-in that um, a lot of capital was was put into that and now it's one of the leading um, flurry um, agriculture is one of their main um, GDP contributors now I'm thinking of but there's no denying in the creative and cult um, yeah, creative sector can actually have the same impact um, looking at the stats but now you get something called narrative in Africa um where the african people do not realize the amazing potential um that our creativity have and what special product it is on an international scale and that we can actually now tap into or we could always but now that africa can support itself with the free movement and ip laws etc cetera, etc cetera, that's now being facilitated by ACSA. If we can now, so this is now my question, <laughs> if we can now do a series of murals to enhance awareness, create dialogue, et cetera, et cetera, um, which theme do you think we should choose? Um, maybe say in three countries, if you, either, if you want to go country specific, but which themes do you think we should highlight in a mural series to really create awareness on the power of Africa's creativity? What a question, Carla. You know, um, 
I think we have to think about something that triggers the mindset of believing in Africa. Because the AFCFTA will succeed or fall on whether Africans champion the products made in Africa and whether Africans can seize it as something deep in their spirit and in their core, that, that we can believe that it is the chance we have to transform this continent. And so naturally as the trade lawyer, as you were speaking, I thought, of course, made in Africa, you know, made in Africa, but made in Africa is not sufficient. It's more about making Africa because the AFCFTA is really about production. And this is the story of trade agreements that they create opportunities for those who can utilize them. So we have to create a consciousness, I think that's the word, a consciousness around Africa's producers to make for the African market. And we have to create a similar consciousness around Africa's buyers to buy those products when they see them. And so if you can find something that merges, that gets a good marriage between this whole idea of creating an Afro consciousness and tying it to the reality of production, I think that would be it. Thank you, Dr. Joy. And I really love that word, Afro consciousness. I think that's going to be part of my daily repertoire of my vocabulary. I love that word. Um, thank you for your time. I'm not going to keep you longer. I know you have a very, very busy day. Um, and thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. And for so helping much. me draft the session as well. <laughs> You're almost welcome. Thank you very much and good luck with the rest of it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I would also like to take this opportunity to remind um, the audience that you can either listen to in French or in English the session. Um, there should be technical support in the chat box. If you're having trouble with that, just pop a message in the, the chat and they will assist you. I would like to introduce the next panelist. Um, and this is Dr. Adewumi. Um, Adewumi. Um, he also want, uh, yeah, he also likes to be called Kenny. <laughs> Kenny um, so Kenny is a curator and an art in health advocate. He holds a PhD in art history from the Amadou Bello University Zaria in Nigeria. He is a curator in chief and co-founder of Now Expressions, a curatorial collective. He is currently a postdoctoral research fellow at the Durban University of Technology. Adewumi has authored several locally and internationally published articles. As a result of his passion for bridging gaps across disciplines, with a specific focus on creating artistic interventions in medicine, he becomes a fellow of the arts in medicine projects in 2021. Thus, Adewumi's current research focus explores the intersections between art, health, and society. Um, I hand it over to you, Dr. Kenny. Thank you very much, Clara. Um, I want to say thank you to Dr. Joy for a wonderful start on the conversation here. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to us today. Um, Chimamanda Adichie once said in her speeches that one of her culture shocks was that she heard someone say in the US that um, was referring to Africa as a country and the person said uh, something in the, in the, in the areas of uh, uh, Italy, well, uh, Italy uh, Germany and Africa as countries. But beautifully, um, FCFTA has upheld that stance as Africa as one country, of Africa being one country because it's bringing us together in one and it's beautiful because this creates a lot of opportunities for us. Um, it enhances the ease of doing business in Africa and in terms of businesses and policies and investments and opportunities is so vast. And it eases mobility, just like um, Dr. John has said. But then we shouldn't be talking about this as if it's all just and by the way, this as if it's just um, automatic. I'll be speaking specifically to artists and the creative industry and great organization and how do we leverage this market how do we fit in um, into this this whole thing that's been created for us as at um, early 
early May um, about 54 countries have signed the agreement so it is happening it's something that's going to happen it's definitely going to happen for us but how do we fit in now the good, good news is that the creative sector has experienced any growth several over the years and so we are good we're doing well everything is fine for us but then that is not enough so i will pitch to us the difficult question of relevance relevance being what we should be looking at and this i think so now the first principle of relevance talks about human recognition and it talks about how humans look for relevance in everything we do we try to maximize uh, but maximize relevance in everything we do um, with the least effort so artists in africa now considering what is happening to us we need to consider relevance as artists in terms of what is relevant to us as artists in this market what is relevant to the one african market what is relevant to our local community what is relevant at this time in this context what is relevant to our funders to our customers and in our open spaces what are the relevant collaborations and relationships we can foster now given this opportunity that we have for ourselves what are the relevant tools and skills we have as artists as organizations that we can leverage and what are the relevant tools and, and, and skills we need to acquire quickly before this this, this wave goes back and then we need to think about the political relevance we need to go out uh, think about the social relevance of what we are doing of our projects of our of our of our of our, of our ideas the economic relevance of our ideas the cultural relevance the academic relevance and the religious relevance of our creativity now i'm going to be talking about um, um, place making for instance in place making we need to think sorry, about dr. The Kenny. Art. sorry yes. dr kenny there's a terrible buzz on your audio and we are struggling to hear you and we really want to be able to hear you i don't know sometimes right, it goes right, away right. sometimes it's really but we really want to to hear what you say I think it might be your, your earphones. Am I better now? Yes, yes. Better now? Everybody, can everybody, yeah. Sorry about that. It's just we really want to cap get what you say. Cool. cool. Should I start again or should I just continue from there? And um, maybe do a little little intro, like a little, little paragraph right, summary. Right, sorry, right, cool, sorry. Cool, cool, sorry. Cool, cool. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. It's Very fine, interesting. Fine, fine. It's fine. It's fine. I was talking about relevance generally. I was talking about relevance. It's um, important for us to think of relevance if we are going to leverage this market um, profitably for us as creatives, for us as artists, for us as um, art organizations, creative organizations. And so in terms of relevance, we need to be talking about relevance in terms of um, what is relevant to us as artists. Um, what is relevant to the market we are, we are going into, which is the African market, what is relevant to the local communities we are entering into and we are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are speaking to, what is relevant to us at this time, what is relevant to our funders, because we, we often look for funding, and what is relevant to our, to our customers, what is relevant to the brand we are, we are, we are, we are, we are putting out, the, our urban spaces, what is relevant in there, and um, what relevant collaborations and networks are we fostering in this time? Because that is very important. Then what relevant skills do we have? What skills do we have that we can leverage? And what skills do we need to quickly acquire so that we can be able to, you know, um, 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 act well in this space now? We need to think about political relevance, social relevance, economic relevance, cultural relevance, academic relevance and religious relevance you know dr joy spoke about some um, qualifications and how we need to push that forward and how we need to fight for the skills we have and make sure that they are considered in the scheme of things going forward in the fcs the fta and in place making for instance we need to think about how art that is relevant to the community and the space can be put forward the need of the community has to be placed at the forefront of what we are doing and that is one of the things that's been done by um, art in medicine, where you find them, um, you find artists going into spaces, into uh, medical spaces, to to fight for and to advocate for for health in, in medical spaces, and then for sanity to for for the healthcare workers and the and people that are receiving care. So as we forge ahead, let us think about community relevance as we promote Africa as one. Well. We should strive to tackle 
truly African issues and not personal matters. It is important that we think about Africa as a community. We, 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 we project Africa, not our personal self, because it's important that we recognize what is happening now. It, is, it has never happened before in terms of trade. So it is, it is, it is a, it's a space for us to project our local indigenous beauty and relevance, those things that make us stand out in the global scheme of things. And so when we ask the difficult questions of relevance in context, then it will help us as individuals to collectively um, determine the appropriate um, 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 ways and approaches to, 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 to um, fit in into this market. Now I'm gonna use one, um, one term that was used by someone I admire so much, um, uh, Rufai Hussein, he calls it global. Global means globally and locally. Global is for us to think of the lo local beauties we have, the local ideas we have, the things that we have locally that, we, that can help us leverage, and then look at how we can project those in the global setting. And that is what um, the, the, the free trade agreement is just talking about. We need to talk about truly Africa. Chino Achebe says, until the lion learns how to tell his own story, then the story will always favor the hunter. So we need to tell our own African story. We need to tell our own, own indigenous story. We need to project, project our own indigenous um, innovations and creativity. Um, let me stop there and then we can move on from there. Thank you so much. Dr. Kenny, thank you for that. Um, I'm thinking of local and I think of your research and it's a, so just to summarize um, for the audience that that's obviously not been part of our individual <laughs> conversations. You are currently at you, obviously with this this me medical at the medical center where you're doing a lot of public art projects. I would love to hear about that and that you have this opportunity to also discuss it with or present it or with the audience, but. I also am extremely interested about your thesis where you discussed how skills and creativity is enhanced through meeting, meeting people, uh, the, 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 the idea of coming together. Um, and now I'm thinking of the AFCATFA, which is going to allow um, free movement of um, and this opportunity to really maybe possibly um, have a, a very big continental creative intermediary, which can facilitate the movement of creatives on a continental level. And then that becomes a form of placemaking. And then obviously you can have projects, which is urban art, and you can tell the story of, uh, um, regarding that. But for now, I really, I'm really interested to hear a bit more about how you use public art in, in your, um, how, um, between, um, to the intersection between art, health and society, um, the project that you told me about. And then also maybe also um, expand a bit more on your PhD thesis. Well, thank you very much. Oh, beautiful question, loaded anyways, but then, <laughs> wonderful. Yes, I'd, um, let me start with, um, with, with moving with a thesis now, how artists move from place to place and then it fosters progress for, for the artists and collaborations. We met online, then we've, we're here now, we're talking here, so which is one of the beautiful ways where how it's a perfect example of what happened do it virtual. So it's important for artists to understand that at this time, we cannot, we cannot afford to stay in our comfort zones and not move out. It's not, it is very sweet. It's very, very lovely to just be in your comfort zone and do what you've been doing before now. But it is very expedient for us to change our mode of doing things, which means we need to move out more. We need to we need to seek collaboration. We cannot emphasize that um, um, more or, or too much because it's important we know that art as a discipline, sometimes the way society see us, we see it as, um, as if it is not so much of a business way of doing things, but it's more of a just self-expression self as if it's charity. Now, to leave, to, to, to leave that, to leave, to leave that platform, we need to 
al um, al align with people in economics, people in finance, people in business, people that have the business sense, either for us to acquire the business skills or for us to just collaborate with them, and then we leverage that. So artists have been moving all around the world on the verge of art for the sake of art and art being the excuse and the vehicle for them to travel all around the world. And then they create art, um, it, it, forms a, it creates a form of agency for them. And if it creates a form of um, platform for them for to showcase their works all around the world. So that is basically what I did and what I looked at. But then I looked at Tony, Professor Tony Okwe, which who has done that severally in different parts of Europe and, and, and Africa and some part of America. And that is one of the very examples of what we should do now. We should think of how we can leverage this free movement between uh, across borders and how we can leave where we are to the next country and how we can last, uh, um, let's say, Muralists from Nigeria can move to South Africa and, and, and collaborate with mural painters in, in South Africa and then produce something very wonderful or move from there to Ghana or from there to Syria alone and produce something very wonderful and indigenous, African. But in doing all that, we need to think of the relevance of, okay, who is funding us? Where's the market? Um, which community are we installing these murals? Now, what collective identity are we putting out? Now, what, how do we want to be seen outside. And so again, let me tell you that to what is happening in art and medicine. Art and medicine now tries to take artists and take medical professionals and bring them together. And then they, they, they work together as, as, as collaborators in the health space for the people that are being cared for, just to be able to facilitate healing. And what we, what we saw during the pandemic was, um, um, creative Art Cities was, is one of is 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 is, is a creative is a collective in Abuja, Nigeria, where they came out and they, they started putting up images of masquerade, well painted images and all that 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 carried uh, um, um, messages like um, um, avoid crowded spaces, avoid crowded, wash your hands, use your nose mask in market spaces, just to help what is happening in terms of a pandemic. And that is a very good example of that. Severally, you have spaces where you go into hospitals to, to facilitate um, um, dance sessions. You have um, where you go into hospitals to facilitate um, uh, 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 music session for the aged um, and, and several of that. So yes, we need to think of relevance. We need to think of now, and then we need to collaborate and foster relationships. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kenny. <laughs> I move now. I move on now to our third panelist, um, Tendaishe Shatima. <laughs> Tendaishe Shatima is a conceptualizer, songwriter, director, and actress. She has extensive and diverse experience in industries such as television, music, business, and development. In 2016, she made her television debut starring in the independent film, The Cook Off, for which she won Best Zimbabwean Actress at the 2018 Zimbabwe International Film Festival. She holds an MBA from Wits Business School in South Africa and a BA in Film Media Writing and Drama from the University of Cape Town. She believes in leaving a legacy as well as making an impact in society. She has offered drama workshops for various youth initiatives and worked as a brand ambassador for a youth marketing firm that aims to educate, motivate, and inspire young learners across South Africa. It is with this passion that um, Tendai um, has also contributed to a recent UNDP Futures Report titled Making the ASTFA Work for Women and Youth. Thank you, Tendai. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carla. You know, it's so difficult to be the last speaker when both the, the, um, the previous speakers were just phenomenal and amazing. In fact, I actually feel like they stole all my notes. Why did you do that? Why? <laughs> um, but to be honest, I think they, they raised such important questions and we all, I think, have those questions and, and thoughts in mind because they are, they are actually exactly what we should be actually talking about. So I'm, I'm happy that we're all on the same page. Um, so I think I'll actually, I was going to end with this, but I'm going to start with this because it's just reiterating what they were saying. I feel like I'm wrapping things up. Um, but basically, um, first of all, happy Africa Day to everybody. Bonjour, Salvona. 
Makaini um, Kunjani, Habari, everything. Um, it's so good to be to be celebrating Africa in such a beautiful way. Uh, talking about creative, the creative arts. I want to just touch on um, a few things that were already spoken about. So, for example, trade, um, inter-African trade. Um, just to again reiterate what both speakers were saying, um, it's such an exciting time uh, because of the AFC FTA because now we can have an exchange of skills, an exchange of resources, of knowledge. I, 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 I think of it this way. Um, I, I ask this question a lot. Why is it that I've been to LA, but I haven't been to Lagos as a, an aspiring international actress? You know, it, it baffles me that I had my first inclination after, you know, graduating was to go to, to the United States and not to a, an African country that's doing very well in, in film and television. So for me, the AFCFTA uh, actually represents an opportunity for me to engage with the best in Africa. The, you know, how can I now see them um, as reachable, not so far away, you know, because a lot of times why we don't interact is because there are these barriers. Uh, there could be real barriers or even mental barriers, right? We think, oh, my, they, they won't uh, take me in, they won't tell me, they won't give me information. Um, but this trade agreement actually opens up a whole uh, new world for us as Africans. How can we leverage exactly what Kenya was saying? How can we leverage on each other's strengths? How can we make sure that um, what we have inside Africa, we ourselves are benefiting from before we even start thinking of the outside? Uh, and I think that's a very, very important uh, thing to note. And I love what uh, Dr. Joe was saying about the value chains in, in the arts industry. It's, it's so important for us. I think a lot of times even parents are very afraid of um, their children getting into the arts because I think there's lack of information. Really this conscious, um, this, co this basically awareness, we need to make people aware of what opportunities lie in the arts and, and creative sector. And so there are, there are so many, a plethora of, of professions one can enter into um, in the creative sector and it's just not well known. Uh, when I think of the film industry, she rightly kind of pointed out almost all of them, um, you know, the different kinds of professions that make up, just making one film, I don't know if you've ever gone to a film and movie or cinema and watched in cinema, the, the number of names that pop up at the end of a movie, a big budget movie, hundreds of people work on films. And yet in, in Africa, we don't have those kinds of uh, big projects. And again, I want to reiterate this issue of productivity, right? Um, there is a lack of productivity in, in the creative sector. And a lot of it comes down to infrastructural problems. Um, I'm talking as a Zimbabwean um, actress, and I'll tell you right now, there is lack of productivity in my country when it comes to filmmaking. It's not that we don't have talent, but we just don't have the resources. We don't have the funding. We don't have, again, the issue of training. Um, you know, there's so many things that are, that are inhibiting productivity. And if we could only just get, um, you know, those things sorted out, um, I, I believe that there'll be more productivity and more to offer on a global stage. Um, and one thing that I also want to mention in addition to everything that's been said is uh, the depolitization of public spaces. I know we're talking about public art today. I feel and believe that there is still a lot to do in terms of making public spaces non-political, right? So how do I explain this? <laughs> But I'm sure you understand what I'm saying, right? Especially in a country like Zimbabwe, where a lot of um, national symbols have become political symbols instead of them becoming just uh, an identity for, for its people, for the national people. Um, I believe that we, we also play a role in, um, as artists, how can we change the narrative or the language um, about what we do so that it's not, it's non-threatening for, for people in power. I feel like sometimes we're always up against um, politicians in Africa. How do we actually um, communicate in their language? For example, I, I wrote my thesis on national branding through storytelling, right? And for me, um, it was such an important thing for me to write about because I, I realized that in Zimbabwe, we have a lack of funding um, for the creative sector. And I was really wondering why. And I said to myself, well, why don't I actually show you know, people in power that the arts can be used as a way of actually um, creating a national brand. We can work together 
to actually build the nation. And um, so for me, one, one issue would be to depoliticize the, the public spaces. Um, but in that, we, we, we start talking about the arts as a form of soft power. And I'm sure we all, we might not know what soft power, okay, some people might not know what soft power is, but it's basically soft power is being able to persuade someone without using aggressive force. For example, America, right? <laughs> America is really good with soft power. And they've been able to basically uh, persuade us that they are the number one nation in the world through music, through art, through, through television shows. How can we utilize the art and creative sector to build, a nation, to build an African brand? How can African countries um, be persuasive in that way using, um, using creative arts? And for me, that's a question that I think, again, people have been saying it, it's an untapped um, tool. We haven't really been using that. And so for me, um, I believe that the creative arts have that power to shape perceptions, not just amongst ourselves to really build our identity as a people, but also to build perceptions of how people see us on the outside. So that public image that people have of us. And so I want to just uh, close by saying that I believe now is the time for Africa to build a cohesive narrative about who we are and where we're going um, as, a, as, a, as a continent. The creation of this narrative, this idea, this philosophy, this identity of Africa is shaped by the creative sector. The creative sector has the ability to shape perceptions. Um, most of us have traveled the world first in our imaginations before we even set foot uh, into different countries and places. We read about them in the book. We watched a video uh, or a show. Um, and so art in itself is exposure and exposure is a privilege. So art is, is exposure to education, it's exposure to information, it's exposure to a way of thinking. And a lot of times people actually associate creativity with innovation. And so it is access to un unlimited possibilities. And so while art is beautiful and it is entertaining and inspiring, it is also more than that. It has the power to make a social Im um, economic impact. It can create jobs, it can create social cohesion, it can attract funding, attract investment, attract talent from around the world. And it's all about how we position ourselves and tell our stories. And so I'll end with that. Um, but it's, it's such an important uh, tool that we haven't, we haven't really utilized yet. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tendai. Um, on that note, um, yes. Nollywood. <laughs> Nollywood generates um, approximately um, 600 US billion, million um, dollars annually for Nigeria economy. And most of this comes from the African diaspora. Um, and, I'm, and I'm thinking now of what has been said already. And we're talking about, um, you know, like um, education standards. And then I think of women and youth. Um, the AFCTFA is said to really be empowering towards women and youth because of you, the trade and barriers that's, you know, um, being minimized, freedom of movement to go buy um, resources to put into a value chain, et cetera, et cetera. That's just one example. Can, have you identified some of these challenges for women and youth to tap into this film or this creative economy that is produced predominantly now by film, I think, because there's such a big team working on that. And it's it's an easier example now to use. And obviously you are an actress, <laughs> a world famous actress. Um, and then also for youth, and can you, can you speak maybe a bit about the possibilities and how to overcome these challenges? Yeah, definitely. You know, um, the creative sector actually is full of women and youth, right? Um, and the unfortunate thing is that the creative sector is informal. And that's something that is absolutely um, unacceptable, I, I believe, in the 21st, 21st century. Right, right now, it's very unacceptable um, because basically the global economy will be, 10% of the global economy will be the creative economy. And if we leave the informal sector uh, and we don't formalize it, it basically means that we are not 
creating the infrastructure for youth to really um, be working in gain, gainfully and to be gainfully employed. We're not creating the systems in which they can then have sustainable in employment. Um, so I, I, I think, so one of the challenges is number one, it's informal. How do we formalize the sector to ensure that they're protected? For example, I work in the, in the film industry. And I, like I said, in Zimbabwe, it's an informal sector, very informal. And um, at the moment, we're actually trying to formalize it because there's exploitation, all kinds of exploitation. People don't get paid. Um, women might be you know, asked to, for sexual favors to get a role. Um, again, people are exploited in terms of working hours. So because it's informal, you don't get those normal um, employment protection kind of. So, you know, you, you might be told to work longer than, than is necessary or um, working conditions will be very poor. You're working in very desperate, desperate uh, working conditions. Like, yeah, it's not, it's not nice at all. So you can imagine. So first of all, let's formalize the sector. Let's have a legal, and I love what Kenny was saying because he actually touched on that. He said, can we get business people, legal minds in the sector? We really need that. If you look at the, uh, and I use America as an example because I think they've done a great job. So in America, it's it's a machine. It's a business machine. It's a commercial vehicle. So you have um, entertainment lawyers, you have managers, you have agents. Everything works as an ecosystem, and so that's really missing. And um, you know, so so again, what you're talking about training there aren't any fellowships for young people to to go on you know because as a creative and i'm sure a lot of creators would identify um, would um re resonate with this as a creative you need time sometimes to just go away for like a month to write <laughs> or to do whatever you do you know hug a tree i don't know <laughs> as a creative you need that time but we don't have fellowships in africa that allow creatives to really create and so can we get room for those things to happen another thing is lack of access to technology, to information. So I know we're in the tech generation, you know, Gen Z, the world of the technology of technology. But unfortunately, a lot of young people still don't have access to data. Um, they don't have access to the internet. So it's, it's pointless for me to say, oh, cook off uh, the film I'm in, cook off is on Netflix. And yet 75% or more of the Zimbabwean population in Zimbabwe hasn't even watched it. And you're right to say that the diaspora is our main kind of, um, sometimes it becomes our main target audience because they have disposable income. Most like, most usually they have disposable income. Um, and so they have become, in my opinion, they are usually a target audience when it comes to streaming platforms. Like, you know, if I, if, if I put out a Zimbabwean movie on the streaming platform, I'm expecting the diaspora to be a main audience for me um, because the locals can't afford it, you know? They can't afford to be on Netflix when they're still, you know, trying to get bread every day. Um, so I think for me, those are some of the challenges. So the informal sector, it being informal and then lack of access to in the Internet, to information, to funding. Um, and then also these infrastructural problems. We don't have legal support. Um, we don't have um, agents, managers to really, for example, I'm a young actress and I made it onto Netflix as you know the first Zimbabwean production ever uh, to get onto Netflix, but I don't have an agent, I don't have a manager. So compared to some of my colleagues in other countries uh, who've been able to, to have their careers managed and kind of catapulted to another level, I'm still having to do a lot of things by myself. And so for, for youth, how do we really nurture talent how do we put them in the best position possible? We need people, we need mentors, we need managers, we need agents who can do that, who, who have skills um, to do that. So all of these are challenges and I can go on and on and on about them, but I will stop there. <laughs> um, now, thank you for that. Um, I'm thinking, so what I'm hearing, especially now with your last segment, is it's difficult for artists to take themselves seriously because of everybody else not taking it seriously. And then it's like it's a, it's a, it's a vicious circle. So then how do you, how it's also, you get also tired of constantly proving your relevance to touch on what Dr. Kenny says, like this is, you know, 
um, how, so, but artists, like there's no denying now that the, this is a, a sector for sustainable development, especially for landlocked countries, countries that do not have any goods or, you know, re natural resources, or you know, this is really a sector for, and also Africa has the youngest population and Africa oozes creativity. Um, yeah. I remember I, I, I went to study overseas and I was just like thinking to myself the whole time, oh my word, Africa's art product is, you cannot compare it to anything else. And this is such a rich commodity that we can use, not only within the continent to create social and economic development and um, coherence and um, a sense of Afro-consciousness, et cetera, et cetera, but also to impose that onto the, in a friendly way, of course, <laughs> on an international level to say, hey, Africa is rising or it's already, already you know, um, there technically and actually, but now it's up to us to believe that and to make that happen. Um, so I'm thinking of how public art can actually assist in this. Um, and then obviously everything will follow. I think there's no like one way of putting something into the, the network of lawyer, artist support, fellowships, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, community buy-in, political activism, you know, like I think I'm thinking of a little ecosystem. I don't think there's one that will be the strongest. It's not like a linear process. And I'm thinking how public art can actually fit into this little ecosystem, makeshift ecosystem um, to create awareness, to actually tell that politician going to work, hey, art is cool if they drive past a mural <laughs> or they see artist painting and the support that they get or they read it in the newspaper they're like oh okay this is actually a viable um tool you know <laughs> or like hey this is cool let's read on this yeah. um and I'm, I'm this is actually more of a closing not a closing statement but, but like a segment into the questions where i'm going to open it to all the panelists and then also to the audience if there's somebody who feels passionate about sharing something or then asking questions but now i'm thinking of how we can actually use public art. I'm thinking of a, like a theme of murals, or I'm thinking of, you know, I, I, yeah, we, this is an action, action brainstorming session. So anybody who has thoughts or questions that we can explore this further, that would be amazing. Um, but yeah, thinking of how public art can increase awareness on these topics. Because I think the average South African, or the, okay, South African, because I'm South African, but the average African do not really know what the AFCTFA is. And they, yeah. don't, they don't know that we're creating this amazing, like essentially the European Union. Everybody knows the European Union. It's like a strong, you know, sense of camaraderie and they all support one another most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like this AFCFA thing is happening or agreement is happening and this is now our time. Um, so how we can use public arts to increase that, but then also how strong the creative sector is and then actually position that as a viable tool for social and economic development. Um, so I hand it over now to anybody who wants to ask a question, unless you want to comment on that tonight. You're welcome to, Dr. Penny, you're also welcome to make a comment. Yeah, I would like to just comment um, just a little bit on what you're saying about public art. It's been proven, I think, in, in architecture and, and those spaces that um, how a space is designed and you know what it looks like and what it feels like to be in that space actually increases productivity. Unfortunately, I, I honestly do believe that a lot of art, artistic spaces have been um, kind of hidden from the public. So, for example, in some in most African countries, if you really want to interact with art, you either go to a market, an art market, or you'll go to the gallery, to a museum. Um, you know, it's not in your face. It's not public. You know, and again, that's I, I think that's why also sometimes there is a lack of appreciation of art is because it's not it hasn't been integrated into everyday life. And that is very unfortunate. And so I, and, and again, about the, the, the impact of public art, right? If you have um, 
especially conscious art that really is actually aiming to 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 kind of change a certain perception and kind of um create a certain messaging um the power of it is that it will build that community's identity and things like that what's fascinating is that i'm actually doing some research on um stone sculpture in zimbabwe and that is actually a uh, public art in in some spaces and one thing that i've noticed is that it's been exported it's one of the biggest exports um in zimbabwe right and fascinatingly enough the united states has all these parks around it or there's some people who have put it upon themselves to put stone sculptures and and stone sculpture in parks and in fact last week um one of our sculptors was commemorated he's alive but they they gave they they named the 14th of may dominic benura day and this is in indiana somewhere and it made me think i was like oh wow this is a, a sculptor he creates public art and some state in in america has decided to actually give him a whole day to commemorate his art what is wrong with us <laughs> you know why haven't we done that it's it's a very interesting um question to have because clearly in some spaces public art plays such an, a vital role in their community and i think we still need to to really get down to what we can do to really understand the power of public art and what how it affects a community and the way it lives and thinks yeah thank you very much dr kenny yeah. yes um let me jump on that and let me just give a rider to what um Ten tendai said wonderful um, um, presentation tendai she's so wonderful you give very wonderful insights um let me even check my notes again all right so <laughs> about what you said about the Zimbabwean artist that was given the space in America. Something like that has happened in Nigeria as well. The, the founder of the Art and Medicine Project in Nigeria, Kunle Adewale, has a Kunle Adewale Day in America, one of those things as well. But then he does not have such things in Nigeria. And I'm, I'm wondering what is happening, just like you're saying, I'm wondering what is happening with Africa, how we're not celebrating ours and our own. And I think it's, it's a question of we, trying to, we having to purge ourselves of the colonial mentality where we think what is outside is better. Someone was saying in one conversation saying that, okay, I'm used to um, wearing made in Italy and all that. So how will I just now suddenly just start wearing made in, made in Uganda or made in uh, Morocco now? Because we're trying to do an Africanness and all that. But it's a, it starts from you and I, it starts from us, changing our minds and changing our mindsets, which is a very good place um, for public art to come in. Mm -hmm. when, you, when, when I walk around in a space and what I see are the things that make me remember and make, make me identify with pride, with my identity and culture, then it becomes very beautiful for me to say, yes, I can wear make it, make, make it made in Nigeria, made in Africa, made in, made in Uganda somewhere. But then we need to consciously bring our art, our very unique identity into our public spaces. It is wonderful for me to dress up and say I'm going for an exhibition somewhere because I'm prepared for it. So yes, I'm, I'm prepared, I'm, I'm longing to see it and all that. But it is more wonderful and it's such an experience for you to just be walking randomly on a very normal day and you encounter a beautiful art piece in a public space maybe music, maybe theater, maybe maybe morale, maybe sculpture, a very gigantic sculpture, for, sculpture for, for that matter. So it, it stays with you longer because it becomes an experience. You actually, you were not looking at, you didn't have to pay for it, but you just let it, you just found it. And then you walk some meters again, you found another thing. And all of these things are speaking to you made in, made, made in Africa and they are communicating African identity to you after a while, it becomes something you want to try. It becomes something you want to look out for the next time we are picking something out online or physically. So I think it starts with us. We need to start the com this conversation. We need, to, we need to keep this conversation going. And we need to make sure that we put it at the back of our mind that Africa should be put first and then the world will, will, will follow. Thank you. I see here's a question um, from Kevin Mutian. So, um yeah so feel free to pop your questions in the the chat and i will read it um and then whoever wants to 
between Sendai and um, Dr. Kenny, feel free to, to answer. So Kevin Mutia asked, whose responsibility is it to create the infrastructure for creatives to thrive in Africa? For example, creation of art institutions and programs that train various crafts in the various in creative economy and trains talent agents, managers to have more formalized and regulated practices, question mark. Well, um, to be honest with you, um, I think it is an artist and I am part of that um, group of people right now who is actually trying to do that in Zimbabwe. So um, I studied a business degree also so that I could have better understanding of how systems are supposed to work. I took it upon myself to do that. Um, if I could, I would also, to be honest, study entertainment law, like everything, I would do it all <laughs> if I could. But to be honest, um, again, it's, I think it is, it is the artist who needs to advocate for those things. But again, even the artists must realize the importance of those things for them to be even advocating for them. And I think I've come to a point in my own career where I've realized the importance of them. I want to um, improve um, my career. I want to be the best of the best, but I can't do it alone. And it takes a whole team of people. You know, A lot of times we see Beyonce and we think, oh, Beyonce is who she is, she's just Beyonce, but she has a whole team of people around her. PR, marketing, whatever it is, um, she has someone who's handling her schedule. She only has to worry most likely about her creative process. And I think that's something that we, we owe to creators in Africa too. Um, so it is the responsibility of the, of, the, of the artist and anyone who has the skills and passion. There's some accountants who are very passionate about the arts. Um, there's some lawyers who are very passionate about, about the arts, but it's us creating an environment within the arts that can have them in the arts and feel fulfilled and be paid. You know what I mean? We can't say, oh, please come to our industry, come to our sector. And when they get there, they're struggling, you know, to, to get paid and things like that. So again, the infrastructure is important so we can um, actually build an ecosystem that's productive, that can create the funds required to, to manage all these people and to have them you know, be successful in their fields, even within our sector. So I, I yeah, I hope it answers your question. <laughs> yeah, and let me, let me give a rider to that as well. And if I would say, yes, the artists, obviously you have to do a lot of work. You have to do a lot of work in making sure that you, you know, I was talking about relevance earlier, making sure your, your skills are up to date, get the relevant skills you need, and then get the relevant collaboration and relationship to help you skill. Because if you don't get the relevant skill and the relevant collaboration, then you just might be struggling because it's a lot of work to think of your artwork first. Creativity is a lot of work. That's why we need to even have time to recreate in some, in some sense. And so it's, it is too much work itself for you to be in your studio, be wherever you're producing or wherever you're, you're getting your ideas from and then putting those things out. But then now you have to think of content management, you have to think of the economic side of it, you have to think of marketing yourself, you have to think of your image as an artist and how you're projecting yourself, you have to think of internationalization and all those things that comes with it. And so it's a lot of work. And so the artist, the average artist has, sometimes do, ha do, do not have the fund to fund that. So which, which is where I, I, I bring in organizations such, such as Baz Art organizations should try to be the right agents for these artists. Yes, it is all business and all that, but then we should not just use the artists and drop them, but we should try to empower the artists. We should try to tell them the truth. You need to go and get this. You need to do this. This is what you should be focusing on now. This is what the market looks like now. This is what the market is going to look like in the next 5, 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. So you should be able to do something about yourself. Your art is getting boring. You need to think of a new way to present yourself. You need to reinvent yourself. These are things that organizations yeah. should be able to tell these artists. And then organize, artists on their own can sometimes, sometimes cannot, cannot tell the, the, the government the truth. But organizations as a body, they have they are on a, on a higher pedestal to tell the truth to the government on behalf of the artists. So while you're doing your businesses and all that, you might want to chip in one or two things in policy formulation in terms of policies and tell them, no, this is, this is going to, what is going to favor the artists in the long run. And I think um, things will get better at this with that. Thank you. And just to quickly just add, um, there is gonna be um, a documentary that's coming out on Netflix 
um, about the Afrobeats movement and how it became a, a global phenomenon. I think it would be interesting, again, things like that, they help kind of shed light on how art is the way it is and how we can actually make a global impact. So I would encourage everyone to check it out. I think it's coming out soon, should be this week or next week. Um, but yeah, Afrobeats has been a global like phenomenon. So it's, it's quite interesting. I think that's a case study for us. <laughs> Thank you very much for the contributions. Um, I'm, I'm also just wrapping my head around the question. And I think just to resonate what both of you um, contributed, I think it's almost like positioning an arts organization, almost like as a social entrepreneur, to have that activism and that drive to really push things forward because from state level, it's too far up <laughs> and the single artist won't have the capacity. So it's really, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, thank you for, for, for that. Um, another question, this was asked a little bit a, a while back. So hopefully it's not too jumpy for you. Um, we know the importance in addressing issues and galvanizing an audience. Oftentimes prompts um, and themes are very specific. How do we practically go about developing a symbiotic cultural and creative space that doesn't hamper the artist's process and expression given in these complex issues they need to tackle? This question was um, asked by Lerato in the chat. Um, I go on that? You can start while I think. <laughs> No, I said, please start, you can start, please, sorry. Okay, so, okay, for, okay I'll, I'll start by saying, um, I'll give an example, and I hope this will be in line with what she's actually asking, because I was trying to really read it and, and kind of, you can tell it's a Harvard person who's typing this, ne? you can tell, is this Lerato? I hope it's the right Lerato. Lera um, anyway, to answer your question, Lerato, I'll give you an example. Um, so in Zimbabwe, I don't know if you guys know that Zimbabwe at some point was actually, you know, a, a great like space in terms of film. And we had movies such as Neria, there was Yellow Card, and those were actually kind of distributed uh, across Africa. And I actually studied um, Neria, for example, the movie Neria at UCT when I was doing my film studies. And so, but these were actually funded by NGOs, right? So there was a huge donor funding for these films. And um, so they, they usually tackled um, social issues, right? And what we've realized for us filmmakers in Zimbabwe is that it's great because there's a lot of funding. So that means you can actually make a good quality film, um, but it's usually addressing certain um, issues. And then they have like KPIs, you know, they, they want to tick boxes. Have you spoken about this? Have you spoken about this? Has the message been communicated? You know, it's very, it's kind of like, um, tackling certain issues and it's only tackling those specific issues right uh, even though it's creative and it's well done and what we've realized is that the creative needs room to be as free to express the story in whatever way they want to right and so that's why independent filmmaking is very important and I think it, it applies to any kind of creative um, expression so it could be film it could be music it could be painting whatever it is um, you still need room for you to be able to fully express yourself without necessarily um, kind of sticking to a social issue per se. I'll give an example. Um, so I think that the, the end of the spectrum would be fantasy films and sci-fi films, right? People would say, oh, you want to talk about, you know, you want to do like an avatar film or like going to space. I mean, that's like, we still, we, we have bread and butter issues. You know what I mean? So there's like the end of the spectrum, but I think both are very important um, in society because the one addresses the reality and then the one spectrum addresses the future. It addresses the aspirations of the people. It addresses like us thinking beyond our reality and kind of dreaming bigger. So I would say, um, Yes, there is a need, I think. To, I'm just, I keep looking at the question, like, am I answering this question? <laughs> there is a need for both to exist. Um, and I'm almost kind of leaning towards the more inspiring filmmaking in my own profession, because I think it really 
it really just kind of uplifts your spirit and um, it helps you to dream bigger than where you are. So, but there has to be, I think, a balance. Um, yeah. I don't know if you have anything to add. <laughs> no, no you, you, you answered so well. You answered so beautifully well. <laughs> and yeah, that was just, that's just it. But yeah, I, I would like to just say that I think funders, funders should, um, should, should respect the artist and should respect the creative process. And we should really, really, as intermediaries, as uh, organizations, as buddies, we should try to fight for the autonomy of the artist, for the artist not to be spoon fed in terms of what he says and what he doesn't say, which comes with the idea of funding, because really, an artist would just, has to, the artist has to eat anyways. But then if you give him enough fund, if he has enough funding and then enough free hand, to deal with issues, then you see the artists really, really engaging in society, really advocating for for real issues in society, and not just advocating for a brand. And, and I think the autonomy of the artist is important. We should respect the creative process because it takes a lot of work. And yes, I think I've answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's wrap up with this last question, also asked by Lerato. Um, let's just hope my scroll works. <laughs> um, so the UNDP Action Report 2021 brilliantly distills the notion of the one African market. Realistically, what sort of markers should we have in place to go gorge success um, given the innumerable markets in Africa? Um, okay. for me personally, this is all my opinions. Um, I think for me, success would be when we are leveraging on each other's strengths as countries. So for example, in Europe, um, you know, there's some countries that, okay, I'll, okay, let me not give an example from Europe. But just basically in Africa, right? And I'll use the creative sector as an example again, because that's where I'm, <laughs> I'm based. So filmmaking, for example, we know that Nollywood in South Africa, they're doing extremely well in terms of filmmaking. Um, and perhaps maybe we know that Zimbabweans are very strong academically. And we know that um, maybe Tanzania and uh, Egypt have great landscapes um, so for example, we've already kind of located, okay, so resources and funding could come from Nigeria and South Africa, maybe resources, skills, training even, because they have really good, well, South Africa has really good schools. So certain spaces will offer certain, um, types of uh, resources. And then we know that Egypt, Tanzania has locations. If we need locations, this is where we can get locations for our films. This is all in Africa, right? Like when we're talking about African films. And then Zimbabweans, maybe they should be writing more. Because another thing that we've discovered is that maybe uh, Zimbabweans and Nigerians could be kind of like the academic, um, I don't know, um, like in terms of creating literature, academic literature and research around the filmmaking in, in Africa. And so everyone is playing their part, but to produce this one product um, that kind of, so everyone's adding their bit to this one product, right? And for me, success would be when I see that, because I haven't seen that. <laughs> I haven't seen African um, countries do that yet. I haven't seen um, this country leveraging on that country's um, kind of skills and us kind of building one thing together. So for me, when I see that happening, yes, then I'll say, um, we're on the right track, but I haven't seen that yet. So productivity across Africa, leveraging on each other's um, resources and skills and whatever. And in fact, right now, and I'll just make a comment quickly about this. Right now, what I'm seeing is a lot of media, and again, media plays a, an important role in all of this. Um, and you know, when you talk about South Africa, there's the whole xenophobia, you know, like we're told foreigners are not allowed in, in South Africa. Or, you know, there's this anti um, kind of Af pan-Africanness, right? Um, but the flip side would be 
if we had more media talking about the AFCFTA, right? If we had, and this is a challenge again to artists and to creatives, are we actually talking about this in a way that is palatable to the ordinary person? And I, I made this comment to the UNDP uh, last year. I said, why is it called the AFCFTA? It's so hard for the ordinary person to say anyway, right? <laughs> like, I actually feel as though we, we need to make it palatable to everybody and, and then make it, I wish more maybe like even a soapy, are soapies talking about this? A lot of people, millions of people watch soapies. Has a soapy ever taken the AFCFTA um, you know, message and put it in a soapy and educate people that you know now we can do market, you can you can sell across the border, you know, something like that. Like we need storylines that tell exactly what's going on on the ground. So um, media plays a big role. So I would love to see more narratives. But again, this will all add up. When I start seeing products and productivity across the African nation that shows like like what you're saying about the EU um you know I'm actually a product of the EU in some way because I got an Erasmus scholarship and um the Erasmus scholarship is for EU students and you know they basically get sponsorship to travel to another European country and study there um and so for for, for us are there scholarships for African students to all go to one African country to study. I haven't seen that yet. So I need, um, I need to see more of that. Yeah. I don't know if Kiende has anything to add. Sorry, uh, let me jump on that. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think we should go back to the days of trade by barter where you bring what you have in your house to the market and the other person brings, brings what they have in their house to the market and then we exchange. But then in this case, we, we put these things together and then we create something wonderful. The F F T F F C F T A market, <laughs> just like you said, it's very difficult to pronounce. And I was wondering why they had to do that to us. But then we'll get used to it. We what will. I'm thinking now <laughs> is that we are not competitors, we are collaborators. Yeah. Different countries in Africa we're collaborators. So we don't need to we don't need two countries doing the same thing or struggling to do the same thing. We need two countries coming together and bringing their strengths and um, and covering each other's weaknesses, you know. And, and then we, we we come together, and then it makes it makes sense when we now see that yes, we are one 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 Africa in one African market. So if you want to make a car, the country that has more of, of, of iron come come the one that has leather yeah. for the seed, the one that has more <laughs> for the for the fuel and all those things and the fiber and all that will come together and the rubber for the tire will come together and produce a car not the same country and then not uh, one an african country that has something else a component that can be done in another african country decide to take it to belgium instead and then you still leave your fellow african and all that and because most of the trades we we do in in, in africa currently a lot of uh, 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 foreign um the, the monies we make often our trades our imports are going outside and then we we, we leave the intra intra african trade and we should really focus on the intra african trade right now than what we're doing outside and then it goes to the creative industries too that we as creatives should think of how to collaborate again i cannot put that enough and say creatives should go and check their skills and see what they need to get and what they need to add to what they have now. If what you need to get is not something you can get, make sure you find profitable alliances and collaborations and relationships that you guys can you can that you can work with. Look for people you can work with, um, 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 skills you can leverage, and look for how this market is going to work for your favor. I think I'm. I think I'll drop you there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to close this session off by, again, thank you, saying thank you to all the wonderful panelists in the session and that we could use and learn from your amazing minds <laughs> and experience to help, this is, to help us also think about this mammoth of a project that we want to undertake as Bazart. Um, and thank you to to help us also ponder on the, the power of public art and how it can be a powerful tool for learning and discovery um, on the African continent and for the African continent. So thank you everybody. Um, 
yeah, and with this, I close. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Rise Africa. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, Tendi. And thanks to everybody that came. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you for a great time.